Blocking, I'm always fairly exact, fairly precise. However, paradoxically, Scott Wentworth, myself, and Stephen Wilmette, and uh, were very organic. Certainly, Wentworth and I would change blocking in the Dover scene. He was playing Gloucester beautifully. Um, we would allow that to evolve simply because it was Tuesday at 3.45. And he'd go that way, and I, you know, keep in mind, he was blind, so he didn't know where the hell he was going. And I would go somewhere else, and ah, you can't see me, I'm over here now. But we allowed, because we thought, and it was a vulgar display of everything we'd learned up to this point. We've both been on that stage forever and ever and ever. We've learned from the best guys. We thought, look, we know how to use this stage. We know how to share. Let's play tennis here. This is Wimbledon. You hit it that way. Sure, I can hit it that way. You hit it that way? What a great idea. I don't know what's going to happen to you. No, but are we going to still obey the festival's rules and Shakespeare's rules? That is to say, make sure it communicates to the people who paid? Yeah, but we're going to challenge and excite ourselves, and we're not really going to know how it ends. In brief, what are the festival stage, the rules of the festival stage? There are some very fundamental rules about working on that thrust stage, and the first thing to know is that there's very little set, and what set there is is insignificant in terms of how it helps the actors. You're not going to be immersed in a beautiful, handmade set that tells you that is the reality you're now in that convinces you, oh wow, I must be an 18th century actor, I'm in an 18th century set, and it's meticulous and beautiful. And I've worked on those both in film and television and on stage, and they're great and they're very helpful. The festival is naked, and you're naked in a very different way. The moment you come up center and land on the stage itself so that you can be seen by each and every seat, you're exposed three-dimensionally. They can see behind you, they can see in front of you, and if you're judicious, you can control the house with a merest turn of your head. So from here, I have, say, 950 people, and then I have another 950 people just doing that. And they all need to see you every now and again. And you need, you need to develop a sixth sense about how much they need to see you and when. And I grew up on this stage. I, I came to the festival in, I think, 81, and I... I embraced the mythology that Douglas Rain could walk that stage backwards in the dark, including the stairs and the vomitoria. He could just float. He knew it. He knew the, he, his toes knew the stairs. He could just be in that space and face, always knowing who he was looking at, who he wasn't looking at, who required more sound because they were back there. If you had to describe that festival stage as a musical instrument, what instrument would you choose? Cello. It's a cello. Why? Because you take the, the actor's soul and sound, the human voice, which is in the broadest range probably more cello than viola or violin, and as an artist, with all of your ideas and your rehearsal notions, your colleagues and your director, you walk onto that stage and you stick the spike of your understanding into the wood of that stage and you play. And this ties in imagistically to a, a phrase that Bernard Hopkins, a terrific actor and mentor, gave me about how we do it. Because the notes are always the same. The music of Shakespeare is exactly the same for every player who comes to it. But what distinguishes you and me? The bowing. It's how we decide to play those same notes. And so that's how I would see it.